Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A. Uh, no, actually, I'm sorry. This is History of Science and Technology Q&A. Um, and uh, happy to talk about things that I've been involved in or other things I might know about. And I see a few questions here that have been sent in or saved up. Uh, well, there's one from Sleepyhead. Why did electromagnetism become a focus of study so late in human civilization? Wouldn't the ancients have observed and studied magnets and static electricity and characterized it as easily as us? It's an interesting question. I mean, a lot of things don't get studied until there's a certain ambient kind of set of understandings that make it possible to sort of meaningfully study something. So for example, what would the ancients have known? They would have seen lightning. They didn't know what lightning was. I mean, in you know Greek mythology, it was all about Zeus and thunderbolts and things like this. They knew lightning was a powerful thing, but I don't think they had any idea what it was. I don't know whether Aristotle wrote about lightning. He you know, tended to try to catalog information about lots of kinds of things. Um, but I think that they, for them, lightning was sort of a thing of the gods and not something that us humans would sort of be able to deal with, so to speak. I think uh, people certainly had seen lodestone, um, which, um, and, and had seen uh, magnetic materials. Um, I think that, um, uh, where would they have seen magnetic materials? Well, I mean, any kind of, uh, they would have, um, uh, they, they certainly would have seen static electricity. Um, I'm not sure that anybody cared about static electricity. I'm not sure anybody, you know, you rub your hand on some sheep, you know, skin, something or other, and then it starts making sparks and so on. It'd be an interesting question whether any writers in antiquity commented on that. I'm not sure that they did. I mean, I think that it is an interesting thing that there are things that one observes in the world that people just say, oh, it is that way, we don't know why and we don't care. Um, I think you see that an awful lot in the history of science, that something isn't cared about until its time is, has, has arrived. I mean, in my own efforts to understand how simple rules produce complicated behavior and things like you know, cellular automata, where you have a, a line of cells, each let's say black or white, and you have some rule that says, how to color the cell on the line below based on the color of the cell above it and to its left and right. It's a very straightforward setup. And, you know, I've always thought somebody in Babylonian times when they started making mosaics that were made from square arrays of, of, uh, of stones could perfectly well have studied cellular automata. So far as I know, they didn't. Nobody's ever found a mosaic that looks like that. Um, but I don't know why. And I don't really know what aspect of it would have, uh, you know, wh what is the thing that makes people not study that? So a good example that I have looked at is nested patterns, where you have, you know, a pattern and then other things nested inside it, and then that keeps going. And there's sort of a question of, of where did that first get used? And I think it had a few origins, but I think the, the most striking origin was from a family of mosaic layers who lived around 1200 AD, um, mostly in Italy, although they did work as far away as Westminster Abbey in London and, and other kinds of places. Um, and they, they figured out that you could make these nested patterns, or at least a particular person, Cosmos Cosmati, in like 1210 to 1215, somewhere around that time. Uh, I wonder if they knew Fibonacci, who lived in, in Italy around the exact same time. Um, uh, it'd be, be interesting to know. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether the, I think the world of the stonemason artisan type crowd uh, surely intersected with the, the mathematics and commercial mathematics crowd, which is what Fibonacci, Leonardo Fibonacci was, was uh, involved with. Um, but, uh, uh, and, you know, that would be a, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. I mean, what would, why didn't somebody notice, oh, there are these phylotaxis spirals that uh, are these particular sort of arrangements in, um, uh, of, in, that are very generic in plants, um, where sort of the sequence of numbers that you get out is the Fibonacci sequence, and then Fibonacci had his rabbits from 1210 AD or so, and um, these people were doing their mosaic tiles, 
where they discovered nested patterns. And, but, and in fact, there's a, there's a, a, a church in, in Italy, in Anagni, Italy, where you can see, and there's this crypt where they, where you can kind of see that they were sort of uh, experimenting with different kinds of tiling patterns. And eventually they figure out the nested pattern. And because it's, it's some uh, sort of set in stone, so to speak, because these were mosaics, it's still there 800 years later, and you can see kind of the experiments that they did. But this idea of nested patterns arises in 1200 AD. It then disappears for close to 800 years until pretty much the early 1900s. And then in the 1970s, through the work of Benoit Mandelbrot, it becomes much more prominent in fractals. And then everybody kind of knows to talk about nested patterns. But before that time, you know, the art historians writing about the Cosmati, they discuss, you know, the, the lions and tigers that they portray in their mosaics and the, the different ways they had to generate color in their stones, but no mention of nested patterns. They're just blind to that because it's just something that there isn't a sort of ambient understanding of that people are primed to. And, and I'd rather suspect that something like static electricity, uh, even something like uh, magnetism, um, let's see, Gilbert, I guess, was the person who, when was that, 1600s maybe? Uh, really started talking about magnetism and the magnetism of the earth and the fact that you, know, you could have magnetic compasses and things like this. Um, but, uh, and, you know, why didn't that happen earlier? Some of those kinds of things were technologically determined. Um, you know, for example, I don't know whether making a compass that has a little magnetic needle that can turn around, I don't know whether people had kind of bearings that were good enough to, um, you know, or, or had, had figured out, you could kind of like, just like have that sort of sit on something where it could turn easily enough that it could actually turn in, um, in response to the Earth's magnetic field. I mean, that's why, for example, in the time of Aristotle, when there was a sort of the question of what would laws of motion for things, for Aristotle, most things when you push them wouldn't keep moving unless you kept on pushing them. Whereas by the time of Newton, it became a little bit clearer that uh, Newton understood the idealization that you could push something and if it wasn't, then that there was actually a, that it was sort of a, a separate add-on kind of concept that there was friction that slowed the thing down and that without friction, that there was a reasonable, that the core phenomenon was the thing just keeps going in a straight line, Newton's first law, um, and, uh, um, and that that wasn't something where friction was somehow intrinsic to the nature of things. Probably was helped by, by Galileo and so on, noticing, you know, talking a lot about things falling. And again, when things sort of fall through the air and you have, you know, the, the drop a feather in a rock, well, you know, the, the feather lands a long time after the rock in the Earth's atmosphere. And so again, you could say, well, it's not intrinsically the case that feathers and rocks fall at the same rate. It requires kind of a, a conceptual idealization to realize that's the case. I mean, eventually, when was it Apollo 14 or something, um, astronaut there dropped a feather and a rock on the moon and observed that, you know, in the vacuum of the moon, they really do drop at the same, with the same acceleration and, and, and uh, uh, hit the ground at the same time. Um, and uh, it's something much assumed in the actual celestial mechanics of getting a spacecraft to the moon. But in any case, so I, I think this, this question of, of what causes people to sort of uh, conceptualize phenomena to the point where they can discuss them. Now, you know, let's talk about electricity. Um, the, uh, um, the first, I mean, uh, electricity in, uh, you know, the, the first experiments, who was that, Volta, I guess, um, was doing experiments with frog's legs, a rather gruesome experiment, where you are sort of, uh, you know, with electricity, you're, you're giving a shock to the frog's leg and the frog's leg jumps. Because as we now know, uh, there's an electrochemical process in muscles that causes muscle contraction to happen in that case. But in a sense, what is the essential phenomenon? It has nothing to do with frogs, nothing to do with muscles. It is an intrinsic thing to do with this phenomenon of electricity, which is an abstraction far away from frogs and muscles and so on. And that, you know, understanding how to pull away that abstraction is not so obvious. Just like, you know, you see a lightning bolt. What is it? You know, is it electricity even? 
I don't know when that was figured out, that, that's, that it was electricity. Um, I think that uh, the whole question of uh, kind of um, the notion of electric currents and batteries and um, all those kinds of things, I mean, that was a, a story, I think, of, of um, well, that was a story of the 1800s, but it wasn't a story. I mean, the, 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 um, uh, the, the kind of really electricity is an important thing rather than just like, oh, that's an amusing phenomenon that you can make sort of toy things out of. That wasn't understood until I would say uh, solidly into the 1800s. I mean, there's a famous quote from um, Gladstone, British prime minister, talking to Faraday, probably this must have been 1840s maybe, 1850s perhaps, um, when, uh, and uh, you know, Faraday, who was um, uh, a, um, a very experimentally oriented scientist who developed some very abstract theories, like the idea of fields, for example, was a Faraday idea. Um, but, uh, you know, famously Gladstone asked Faraday, who was talking about electricity, you know, what's the good of electricity? And Faraday talked about, well, you know, it's like a, a newborn baby and, you know, it could, has many potentialities. And Gladstone kind of just stopped him and said, well, what I really want to know is can we tax it? Um, since that's sort of a, a long time business of politicians, so to speak. The, um, uh, um, and I think, you know, that kind of gives an indication that at that time, electricity was still kind of a toy phenomenon. It was only uh, much later with, with uh, people like Edison and so on, figuring out, um, uh, you know, that you could use it for electric light and, and so on, that it became clear that it was sort of a, a big thing worth talking about. So, you know, good question, what, and, and I don't know how much uh, sort of study of electricity before, I mean, it's sort of an interesting thing that, uh, now that I think about it, the things like Maxwell's equations that describe um, uh, the electromagnetic field and, and Faraday's previous work characterizing the electromagnetic field and doing things with iron filings showing the, you know, the directions of magnetic flux and so on, that those predated uh, the, the sort of the practical use of electricity for things. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, it's sort of a cautionary tale, perhaps, of phenomena that we see today where we say that's just a toy phenomenon. And then later on, we realize, well, actually, it's a phenomenon that has uh, deep practical significance. Um, and I think that's a, that's a repeated story in the history of science, that something that seemed like it was just a, a, almost a toy, and there were things where there were phenomena, uh, like automata, for example, uh, you know, mechanical automata that, that do things, and, you know, it's a duck that walks and quacks and so on. There were many toys of that kind from certainly the 1600s and so on, uh, there were many such toys long before the sort of use of clockwork things for more than clocks was, was a common kind of a concept. And I think in, um, uh, in my own work, this whole phenomenon of, of simple rules, complicated behavior, there are a zillion examples of where that was observed, but thought to be irrelevant, was thought that it was just like, oh, you know, we're making an artificial neural net and it's a nuisance that in certain domains, this artificial neural net starts generating all this kind of quotes, noise and randomness. Because what we really want is the domain where it does something different. And so that phenomenon, which was sort of a very important phenomenon, um, was not really talked about. You know, I just realized literally yesterday something about a um, uh, piece of my own history in a sense. Um, you know, it's a fascinating thing to me at least, uh, you know, sort of how one pieces history together. There are lots of specific sort of dots. And the question is, can you join the dots into a meaningful narrative? And particularly when the history is about things one's done oneself, it's often very confusing because you know the dots, you know the specific things that happened, but on the ground when they were happening, you were not thinking about the overall narrative. It's only maybe decades later you can look back and see the narrative that joins those dots. And I was just doing a big exercise um, 
just posted something about the making of my new kind of science book, where I did a lot of kind of looking in archives. I had pretty good personal archives um, and uh, trying to piece together what had happened. And some of that, the arc of that story is, I only remembered the points. I'd never figured out the arc of the story and how things happen. But I'll tell you a, a, an arc of story, which I, I just figured out. It's sort of embarrassing. I didn't know this before. So in the 1980s, I started working on cellular automata and how simple rules can produce complicated behavior. Now, I had previously worked a lot in, in traditional theoretical physics. Um, and uh, I, so I, I started off studying simple rules like in cellular automata. And the immediate thing I would have expected is, oh, I've got all these fancy mathematical methods and so on. Given these simple rules, I can just figure out what they do. I can use all these mathematical methods to come up with an analysis of what's going on. Okay, well, that didn't work. Now, meanwhile, at that time, early to early, midnight, early to mid 1980s, I got a number of uh, very uh, uh, distinguished mathematicians, for example, interested in these problems of what do these simple systems do? They worked on them and they were very frustrated because they could get practically nowhere. The methods that they knew just didn't make any progress. Methods that I knew didn't make any progress either. What I realized now, long after the fact is, the sort of, in a sense, the key achievement that I had was not just to block at that point, not just to say, look, you know, these systems, the methods I know don't do anything. Oh, let me look at those aspects of these systems where the methods I know do do something. Instead, I kind of turned that situation on its head and said, look, the fact that we blocked, that in itself is significant. And that was what caused me to discover computational irreducibility, which has been sort of a cornerstone of many kinds of things that have been figured out since. And, and now, you know, it, it uh, I think led to things like the proof of work idea for blockchain and all kinds of unexpected consequences. But the, um, the fact that in that situation where one was kind of had a particular methodology, one could have just blocked and said, we're done. There's nothing to say here. Let's go look in another corner where we can say something about the system. But instead it's like, you know, to the big achievement in a sense was to think to turn that situation on its head and say the very fact that we blocked, the very fact that we got this great complexity from this simple set of rules was the important thing. And then build what I ended up in the title of the book that, that came out 20 years ago now, you know, called A New Kind of Science, so to speak. Anyway, a few thoughts on, on that. Okay, there's a question here from Brady. Why did Turing come up with Turing machines as a basis for computation and not tag or substitution systems or mobile automata or register machines? Well, I think uh, at the time, most computing was done in places like banks. Most of the let's work something out, the most sort of industrial place where things were computed was things like banks, maybe insurance companies and so on as well. And what Alan Turing was trying to do, I think, was to make an idealized model of how bank clerks worked. And bank clerks would have certain, you know, they'd have certain data that's in a file cabinet and they would go and they would take something out of the file cabinet. They would do a computation on it. They would put the result back in the file cabinet. And that's kind of the thing that he was modeling in a Turing machine where you have a tape that has certain data on it and you have his, his head that's going up and down the tape. Now, an interesting question, why did Alan Turing have the concept of a tape? And it's an interesting question whether telex machines existed. I don't know. I don't think that they did. Um, okay, so a little bit of history here. Um, so a very early invention was the, the punch card. It was invented around 1800 by um, Marie Jacquard um, to make the Jacquard loom, um, which was a, 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 um, a weaving machine that um, uh, was controlled by where, where you could specify the pattern for weaving by uh, using this punch card. Um, and there was sort of a mechanical device that would... Um, uh, would, would, would be based on that. And that's what, for example, Babbage's 
concept for the analytical engine um, was based on using jacquard type punch cards um, to program the engine that was thought about in the 1830s and so on. Um, interestingly, I know, uh, you know, Ada Lovelace has this lovely uh, paragraph where she talks about um, um, the analytical engine weaves algebraical patterns as the jacquard loom weaves patterns of birds and flowers. Um, because it's sort of using the same technology for specifying sort of what to do. And I, I know that um, Ada Lovelace, for example, went on a tour when she was a late-ish teenager, went on a tour with her mother of, um, the, uh, of the mills in Northern England. This is in time of the Industrial Revolution. And um, the, the mills are, um, uh, have these looms and, um, uh, so she got to see a bunch of these sort of punch cards in operation. That was that was uh, a decade before um, she ended up writing about Babbage's analytical engine and trying to sort of abstract away from the engineering details of the analytical engine. But that was kind of the first model for computation was the analytical engine and this notion of sort of the punch card as the way of deciding what um, algebraical operations to use uh, Ada's kind of term for it um, would be done. So that that whole story kind of more or less disappeared for a very, very long time. And the environment that Turing was working in, I can tell a little bit of that history, but I think Turing um, really his, his thing was to model uh, bank clips. Oh, I was gonna say about, about um, uh, tapes. I don't know where Turing got the tape idea from. Uh, there certainly was a technology of paper tape that was used for telex machines. And it's a really good question when telex machines came into existence. Um, because what they were, were kind of, in a sense, automated telegraphs, you know, the, which uh, at least by the time I knew about them, were using phone lines, um, the, uh, um, um, in, um, um, uh, to, to transmit data. So for example, when I was a kid, um, I would see um, uh, my father ran a, a company that, that uh, did import export kinds of things uh, from different countries around the world. Um, good thing if you're a kid and, and do stamp collecting or something, but um, uh, the, you know, a, a big part of their business was, you know, sending messages all over the place. And so they had telex machines. And this was, this must have been, well, mid 1960s. Um, but I think they were well developed technologies. So I'm, I'm guessing they've been around for at least 30 years and probably since since the time of, of Turing and the 19, and that Turing machines were 1936. Um, so the, uh, what did a telex machine do? It had a paper tape that you would prepare offline, and you would, you know, you would you would prepare it, and you would make this punch tape, um, and uh, the um, uh, this, and then this tape would be. Then you would connect your your phone line to the place where you were sending the the message, and uh, you would, and the tape would get run through, and the tape would specify. It was usually five hole tape. It would specify. Uh, different characters, much like a telegram, they were usually sort of all capital letter characters. Um, the uh, um, and uh, and you would sort of minimize the time where your phone line had to be open um, by uh, um, by the fact that you prepared it on this paper tape. So, um, uh, oh yes, okay, various people are pointing out. All right, telex became a thing in 1933, apparently. Oh yes, Pontius mentions ticker tape. Yeah, that that's that's right. That was that was Edison's first invention, right? Was um, this idea? Huh, I, I'm not sure about all of this technology. I mean, the the um, uh, for stock markets, there was this notion of uh, recording the trades, and I think Edison invented a, um, a sort of remote ticker tape machine, which I I think was based on. Uh, a, a telegraph and the telegraph comes from the 
1830s, maybe Samuel Morse and so on. Um, and uh, I mean, the the that was a um, an early electrical machine, so to speak, the telegraph. Um, in any case, so so I don't know whether you know. So I guess this idea of information being stored on a tape was a little bit of a thing by Turing's time, although those tapes were definitely write once tapes, like a telex machine tape. You just you write it once and then you send it through the machine. Um, but uh, so I suppose that idea of a tape may have come from those kinds of places. Now, you know, the tradition into which Turing was, was, was operating, um, the, uh, um, uh, okay, David is saying here, that the ticker tape stock price telegraphs were invented in 1867 by a certain Edward Callahan, an AT&T employee. That sounds implausible. When did AT&T, that was a JP Morgan enterprise to, to pull together what became AT&T, I think, from a lot of regional phone companies. I mean, it's kind of like the same thing that happens in many industries that there are, first of all, very geographically distributed, happened with the internet, happened with, uh, you know, happened with um, uh, internet connectivity and, and other kinds of things um, that, you know, first there are lots of regional uh, sort of deliver, uh, you know, providers of those kinds of things. And then it all gets kind of centralized because of economies of scale. But um, uh, in any case, I, you know, to, to say something about the tradition that Turing operated in, this whole question of sort of how do you make what, how, how do you mechanize mathematics? A mechanize not in the sense of having a machine do it, but in the sense of streamline the way that humans would specify it. And I think that idea, you know, for example, Frege, Gottlob Frege in the 1860s, 70s, uh, was very much interested in this kind of, you know, could you derive mathematics from logic and in so doing, sort of build a tower that would be, um, uh, would kind of streamline the, the specification of mathematics. Now that became more serious with people like uh, Piano in the 1880s, who um, uh, really tried to sort of write down uh, in, in, a, in a streamlined mechanical way what mathematics might be like and, and write down a, a sort of streamlined set of axioms in his case, Piano particularly concentrated on the axioms of arithmetic and so on. I mean, to, to explain a little bit, you know, the idea that it really mattered to do mathematics in a systematic way, as opposed to just, well, you know, we can see that it's true, so that's good enough. I mean, there was a tradition of that kind of thing all the way back from Euclid for geometry. It became more of a thing in other areas of mathematics by the 1830s and so on, where people were starting to invent kind of purely formal structures like group theory, like quaternions, um, like uh, um, the notion of curved space and so on. These were things that were uh, sort of purely abstract constructs where you kind of didn't have an intuitive sense of how things would come out. So you really had to build everything from this sort of formal axioms. But, but Piano, I think, produced this little book um, about uh, sort of axiomatic mathematics. Um, he was a very uh, kind of, let's make everything axiomatic, including human language. So he invented a thing called interlingua. There was another thing by the same name later. Um, that was a kind of Latin based language that was his kind of attempt at a formal human language as well as writing down his mathematics formally. But I think then, you know, David Hilbert and then Bertrand Russell were in their different ways instrumental in this idea of let's streamline sort of how you write down mathematics. Now then, you know, 1920, uh, sort of two big initiatives. Well, 1921, Emil Post kind of tries to say, well, how can you tell, I should explain, 1910, uh, Whitehead and Russell produced their Principia Mathematica, this two volume work, which was an attempt to kind of show that you could derive all of mathematics from logic. And it uses absolutely grotesque notation and it's very hard to understand. And I consider it largely a show off exercise. Um, I'm not sure that, um, I think Russell was proud of the fact that nobody had really, you know, only five people had ever read it or whatever he said. Um, and it, it, it proudly goes through, you know, I don't know what, um, uh, 100 pages of text 
before it, it manages to prove that one plus one equals two. And you know, it has a lot of notational problems. Like for example, it uses dots instead of parentheses. So you don't get the, the kind of match fixing of parentheses. And that's a, that's a big, big, big nuisance. Then it also makes the mistake that was repeated with, for example, APL as a, as a computer language that it just has too much notation that nobody knows. And so it has at the back, it has this huge long list of all these different kinds of notations. And you know, people just don't have that big a notation buffer. This is something that as a designer of computational languages, I've been very interested in. And, and basically the fact that we are able to build computational language is a consequence of the fact that we can leverage human language. We can have Wolfram language functions that are whose names are based on English words. If we had 7,000 things that were all hieroglyphic symbols, it would be absolutely hopeless. Nobody would ever be able to learn it. But we can leverage the existing learning that people have of human natural language to, to be able to provide them something which is, is also a computational language. And Whitehead and Russell didn't, didn't block that. And instead, they chose to invent very pure notation um, in sort of an imitation of mathematical notation that had existed for a few hundred years by then. But they didn't realize that if you, if you bring it on in boatloads, people just lose it. Uh, I suppose as a practical matter, I know that um, uh, Cambridge University Press published the Principia Mathematica books, and there were a lot of uh, you know, exotic notations there. And um, uh, it said, uh, somebody actually from Cambridge University Press told me this story years ago, that um, uh, the, the press really objected to all of this weird notation, like how are we going to typeset this? They were using lead type. So they were using, um, you know, actually putting the symbols in there and they had fonts that were, you know, letters of the alphabet and they had some Greek fonts and things like this. But when it came to exotic symbols, they just didn't have that type. And so, uh, so Russell agreed to pay for the um, uh, making the actual pieces of lead that would be the characters that would be printed in the book for his exotic notation. And according to my informant from Cambridge University Press, who um, uh, Russell was to be seen in the streets of Cambridge with a wheelbarrow wheeling the lead type to the press to be used in, in the Principia Mathematica books. Um, now, you know, um, it wasn't a very good idea, but um, those books were very famous in their time and really led, there were really two traditions. There was the David Hilbert tradition and there was the Russell Whitehead tradition, but that really was the thing that everybody was responding to. Um, I mean, by, uh, you know, Gödel was responding to Principia Mathematica in his original paper. Um, Turing, in his original paper, um, uh, which is um, on computable numbers and the Entscheidens problem. The Entscheidens problem is a decision problem that was invented by Hilbert. Um, and uh, that was kind of the problem of if you can write something down notationally in mathematical logic or in sort of streamlined mathematics, if you can write it down notationally, can you determine, does that, does that mean you can determine it's true or false? And so in other words, is, is the pure writing down of something uh, sort of, is that what you really need? And then you can always solve it. And what Turing was arguing was, no, you can't. What Gödel was arguing was that Principia Mathematica had a similar kind of problem. They'd come from slightly different notational foundations, but it was the, the same idea. But anyway, post, 1921, um, he was really taking Principia Mathematica and trying to sort of idealize that and saying all these things that they're doing with all this crazy notation and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do we represent that in a more streamlined way? And he came up with string substitution systems. And uh, that was the basis for his, uh, well, his tag systems were even an idealization of that a simplification of what you need to do. You don't have to replace things anywhere in a string. You can just do it at the front of the string and stick the replacement on the back of the string and keep cycling around. Um, that was 1921. And you know, Post had this period of time where he said, if only I can solve the problem of tag and the problem of, of what happens with an arbitrary string substitution system, then I will have solved mathematics. Then I would have completed the Hilbert program of being able to solve this decision problem and other kinds of things. Once you write down the notation, it's just a question of grinding it and you can get the answer. And, and Post in 1921 uh, uh, realized, oops, the problem of tag is much harder than I thought. 
you know, I looked at this again last year, actually, and tried to finally solve the problem that Post had had. And even with all of today's methods and computers and so on, you know, I forget, I must have run it for hundreds of billions, trillions of steps. I still don't know what it does. Um, and and um, uh, so, you know, Post, uh, that was the thing that Post backed into. Now, it's an interesting thing in terms of history of science. Post sort of understood that that was an important thing. He didn't push it all the way. And so Gödel, who pushed it further, pushed the same kinds of ideas further, came from a different place. And Post always said, uh, you know, by the 1940s, he was saying that, you know, as, as he said to Gödel, um, Post said, I would have discovered Gödel's theorem if I had been Gödel. Um, and Post was very close to Gödel's theorem and to computational irreducibility in 1921, but didn't really have the, the conceptual framework for it. Now, uh, meanwhile, Moses Schoenfinkel in 1920 invented combinators. Uh, where those come from and uh, is, you know, I did a very big historical study of this in, in the centenary moment of, of combinators in December of 19, of December of 2020. Um, and I can say that one really doesn't know where these ideas came from. Uh, the conceptualization, the, the, the ideas, uh, Sean Finkel was sort of in the Hilbert orbit in Göttingen. Um, and uh, the, the sort of one of the originating ideas was this fact that the NAND operation, uh, the, the not AND logical operation can be put together to make AND and OR not an XOR and all the kinds of possible logic operations. And that was a fact that was discovered around 1900, uh, really by at least three different people. Um, one of them was Henry Scheffer, who was a professor at Harvard. Um, he actually came from as as a as an amazing number of the logicians of that time and maybe even now uh, came from uh, kind of the Ukraine Poland type area of the world. So did Henry Scheffer, um, although that was uh, he was very Americanized. Uh, I think he came to the U.S. when he was. Um, a uh, young child, um, but uh, he was a, a professor at Harvard. He was discovering this. Meanwhile, uh, somewhat mysteriously to me, and I haven't tracked down this history, um, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, who was also in the Boston Harvard type orbit, his father had been a professor at, at, at Harvard, um, uh, was um, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce himself, I think was kind of more of a, um, a, a I don't know whether you call him a gentleman scientist or a not a professional scientist, I think, was, uh, I think he worked for the US Coast Guard, um, but he produced a lot of philosophical works um, that are not so easy to understand. But he was another person who, at the, more or less the same time, discovered this universality, this functional completeness of the NAND operation. I think Schoenfinkel was trying to follow kind of the notation of logic, um, but do it for, for, as he realized actually with some clarity, for general mathematics and general computation. But that kind of, uh, that, that uh, lead went cold because uh, Schoenfinkel himself kind of disappeared. And um, uh, well, um, uh, Haskell Curry, who kind of took up the torch of combinators, didn't really think of them in the same kind of way, I think, uh, for, for at least for quite a long time. So, so that, so Turing didn't really have a, um, uh, uh, Turing was kind of operating in a in a sort of independent way, um, and uh, in in thinking about Turing machines, um, I have to say I think probably had Post's work become better known, I suspect that would have been the most natural way for people to think about um, the sort of foundations of computation. I think Turing machines are not, you know, I I would say that they are, if anything, they're harder to program than string substitution systems. Um, and I think that's sort of an accident of history that it went that way. Now, register machines are a much later construct. I mean, they really come after, long after, as a, as a theoretical idealization, they come long after the, um, uh, the actual practicalities of electronic computers that had registers, places to store numbers and so on. I, I believe uh, Shepherds and Sturgis were the people, I believe, even in the Gosh, was it 1960? Something like that. That register machines uh, were sort of introduced as a, as a well, this is another model of computation. Um, I think cellular automata had predated them 
as another model of computation. Um, they are, uh, they were, uh, you know, their equivalence to Turing machines was well known in the 1950s and so on. Um, and uh, uh, so I think that that, um, uh, you know, that, that's another piece there. Um, let's see. The, um, Uh, Parmenides is commenting, the joke was that Gödel was the only person who'd read, um, uh, I think must be referring to Wikipedia Mathematica. Um, you know, I'm, um, uh, I'm trying to remember. Yes, the, um, when I was researching Schoenfinkel, um, there are some people, I think Haskell Curry had read it, because I think there's a, um, a piece of mail from Russell thanking Haskell Curry, if I'm not mistaken, for typos in the second edition of Principia Mathematica. Um, and, and there's a, this, the acknowledgements in Principia Mathematica um, are sort of interesting because they do list a number of people there. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a comment from Philip here uh, about Einstein came to regret the name theory of relativity. Would theory of invariance have been a better choice? Oh, you know, naming of things is so hard because, I mean, I, I can say in my own life, uh, for example, the name Mathematica for our uh, uh, sort of flagship product is good in its time and bad, you know, in, in a later, you know, in, in later. You know, in that particular case, I named Mathematica that because it's, I knew perfectly well that its goal was more general than mathematics, but I named it in 1987. And at that time, two things were unknown. One, the extent to which the thing we were building was we knew its big use case was people who thought they were doing mathematical kinds of things. But the big unknown that was a mistake in retrospect is that I didn't know how mathematics was going to evolve. And the question was, would the things that I would now call sort of the computational paradigm be claimed by mathematics or not? The answer is not. The answer is that mathematics, the way it evolved, it computer science very firmly branched off from mathematics. And that had happened to some extent by the mid 1980s, but not nearly as firmly as has happened today. I think that um, uh, I know sort of in the more ancient history of, of computer science, I mean, you have to realize in the mid 1980s, not every major university in the US had a computer science department yet. Um, I remember, for example, Princeton, when I was at the Institute for Advanced Study, Princeton did not yet have a computer science department. They had an electrical engineering department, they had other things, but they didn't have a, a sort of fully uh, sort of separated computer science department. I don't think Harvard did either. I think it was part of the Division of Applied Science. Um, so, you know, at that time, it was still not a fully fledged, you know, flying on its own uh, type of field. And, you know, it, it was an interesting question whether, whether what the sort of interweaving of mathematics and computer science would be and to what extent uh, it would sort of break off as its own quite separate field. I know that um, uh, when I was at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, the, um, the people who had been there for the von Neumann computer project, a uh, few of them were still there. And um, I remember a, an interesting event where some people, particularly Herman Goldstein, who was um, one of the people who worked with von Neumann, who ended up going to IBM, which is where a lot of the kind of know-how from the von Neumann computer project ended up uh, landing up. Um, coming back to the Institute and giving a talk about sort of the history of computing at the Institute and so on, this must have been Oh, when was it? 1983, four, something like that. Um, there's a person called Julian Bigelow who'd been an early engineer working on the computer project who was still sort of around at, um, at the Institute at that time. Anyway, there were a whole bunch of people and um, there were also people like Andre Vey, mathematician, um, and uh, uh, some other people like that who were kind of in the older generation of mathematicians at the Institute. 
And I remember, I, I think I asked the question and um, to this sort of assembled group, I kind of asked the, the, the mathematicians, you know, what did you foresee about what would happen to computing back in, in the 1950s? You know, von Neumann died in 1956, I think, um, 1957 maybe. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, what did you think was going to happen with computers? And um, uh, for some reason, yeah, I think, I think my own experience had been that there were mathematicians at the time, and this is, um, uh, yeah, in fact, that's right, that's right. I had been doing a certain amount of experimental mathematics, and there were a bunch of mathematicians who said, uh, some, some how they wrote this somewhere, I can't, I can't remember quite where, but um, uh, in criticism of my work, actually, computers will never be relevant for the doing of mathematics. That's, that was probably early 1980s, and I should get a, um, uh, a more concrete reference for that. But so, so in the air was the concept that mathematics was a thing and computers were never going to be relevant to doing mathematics. That had been a previous generation of mathematicians. And I, I remember kind of throwing that question out to this group, and uh, there was quite a really heated discussion about, um, you know, the mathematicians saying, no, 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 of course we understood back in the 1950s that you know, computers would be important for something, just wasn't for the mathematics that we cared about. And um, the, uh, the people who've been working on the computer project saying, no, no, you, know, you, were, trying to, you, know, you were trying to get us out of the building and you know, you know, get the whole thing away from here. It's, it's all just a bad idea, so to speak. So it, it, this whole interaction between you know, mathematics, computer science, uh, would computer science, would even theoretical computer science be a part of mathematics or would it be its own thing with something still very much in the air? And so in the naming of something like Mathematica, um, it was kind of a, a little bit of a, a calculation of whether the, the mathematics would expand in its domain. And in fact, it, if anything, it's contracted a bit in its domain, um, uh, whereas the whole sort of computational paradigm has greatly expanded. So it remains a, a challenge now as we talk about Wolfram language and so on, and as we're trying to sort of describe the whole system that we built for executing computational language, it's one of my uh, uh, long time projects to try and um, uh, come up with the right description and name for that thing. And it's difficult to do because a thing like it doesn't otherwise exist. And so it's not a thing where you can say, well, I'm gonna give it that name and everybody knows what that name means because many other things are named like that. So I think in terms of, of um, the theory of relativity, I don't know what the ambient uh, notion of sort of relativism in particularly the social sciences, uh, how prevalent, I mean, that was a thing that was sort of bubbling at the same-ish time as the theory of, as Einstein's theory of relativity. And I, and I don't know to what extent the, um, I mean, I think some of that predated Einstein's use of the term relativity. And I think maybe he was sort of trying to uh, uh, kind of juice it up by using a term that was kind of in the air at the time. I mean, it's, it's the same type of thing, I suppose. Uh, interesting sort of case, because when I talk about, you know, what do simple rules, what consequences do simple rules have? When I was talking about that 20, 30 years ago, I would always say rules like programs like computer programs. I would talk about simple computer programs because if I talk about rules as a disembodied abstract thing, that's not something people should be familiar with it, but they're not. The kind of rules people can imagine being repeatedly applied and so on, those are in programs. And so that ends up being a, um, uh, you know, that's the metaphor, that's the ambient description is it's all about programs, so to speak even though at some level, the abstract concept has nothing to do with programs. The abstract concept is just about formal rules. And I don't know to what extent Einstein was influenced by kind of the ambient notions of, you know, this is a little bit like what people are talking about in social science, and that will maybe help people understand it, will kind of juice it up, make it seem more relevant, et cetera. I mean, I, I think that uh, it would have been a mistake to call it theory of invariance because, um, uh, at the time, there was an awful lot of stuff that was talking about invariance. Um, I mean, in, in the whole, uh, for example, um, 
uh, quadratic forms, which Herman Minkowski, you know, the person who sort of uh, really, really got big on the t squared minus x squared version of, of, of you know, the invariant intervals and so on. Um, that was invariant forms were a big thing in the late 1800s um, as the sort of theory of, uh, oh gosh, uh, that, that whole set of theories. I mean, determinant theory was a big branch of mathematics. And oh my gosh, what were those things called? Um, there's a lot of stuff to do with sort of the algebra of systems of, of polynomials and so on that was really a, a, a sort of a primary area in, in mathematics at the time. And that was a lot of that was around invariant theory and, and the idea of invariance and so on. So I think that would have been even more confusing because it was it was kind of a, a story that was a story of, of things like this quadratic form that Minkowski kind of injected into relativity theory. So I, I, I'm not sure that, um, um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure it would have been a good name. I mean, it's hard to know sort of so long after the fact, some of these things become sort of just, uh, you know, they are evocative in their time, like the tape of a Turing machine might have been evocative in its time. Today, I'm sure modern students learning theoretical computer science, there's this discussion about a tape, and they're like, what on earth is a tape doing? I mean, the only thing I know about is scotch tape or duct tape or something like that. What, what do you mean tape? Because people are not even familiar with magnetic tape now um, of a thing where you're reading and writing things going back and forth. Um, Actually, that's another interesting question. No, I think magnetic tape post-dated Turing machines by quite a long way. Uh, yeah, yeah, because I think at the time, that's right, people were recording things. Um, for example, one of the things I've tried to track down is um, uh, the um, um, uh, Alan Turing gave a radio talk in 1950 on artificial intelligence. And I've just been really curious to hear his voice. And so I'm just curious, did anybody record that? And I was, was interested in, you know, well, I mean, in today's world, like everything will be recorded, everything's, you know, and, and people are playing things on the radio from tape um, or from, you know, from now from digital kinds of sources. So I was actually, uh, a little while ago, I was happened to be at the Science Museum in London, looking around at some exhibits actually with a friend of mine who for a long time worked for the BBC, and um, actually also happens, my friend happens to be an expert on the history of sound recording. And um, so I was asking him, so, so why didn't the BBC have recordings of stuff from 1950 and so on? And he was explaining that um, the, you know, the process of recording something was pretty expensive. You know, you would essentially cut a phonograph record more or less to record the thing. And that was something that you know, who would do that? It was much cheaper to just bring the talent into the studio, so to speak, and have them give a radio talk in real time. And why would anybody record it? There was no reason to do that. I mean, when I was a kid, for example, they recorded stuff that you would find of that type, things like the speaking clock, for example, that you could you know, call a phone number. I wonder whether those still exist. You would call a phone number and it would tell you the time. And that was a, you know, that was sort of a phonograph record type thing, I think, that was being... Um, uh, that was being used to, to produce that technology. Um, let's see. Uh, um, yeah, Philip comments that ironic that the Bertrand Russell had a very clear prose style and was also responsible for the most unreadable books. Yes, that is an interesting point, isn't it? I mean, I think the thing that is perhaps unfair about some of that is that, uh, I don't know, maybe it's the former perhaps British education system, but there were an awful lot of people. I mean, even, even in my own case, I mean, I don't know, you can, you can all decide whether I'm a decent writer or not, but, you know, it, it somehow, uh, the somehow it was a product. The British education system was being able to write reasonable prose was just an awfully common thing. I mean, and, and it's sort of odd because a lot of the British education system actually didn't involve writing English prose. It involved 
ridiculous, it seemed to me at the time, exercise as well, translated from Latin to English, okay, translating from English into Latin verse. It's like, that's a really weird exercise, which it's not clear would help you with much at all. Um, it's a sort of interesting puzzle type exercise. But for some, for some reason, uh, certain people who gone through the British education system, at least back in the past, I can't speak to today, it seems to be sort of the reasonable writing comes for free. You know, I'd like to think that in modern times, reasonable computational writing in computational language that, I don't know, like our summer schools and summer camps and things, maybe they provide, you know, it would be nice to think that they provide a sort of a, a, a reasonable writing in computational language comes for free, so to speak. I think that, um, so I, I think the notion that, um, uh, so, you know, that tradition of, of English prose writing seems to be uh, kind of a, a thing. I, you know, it, it is, I will say that I think um, that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a super useful thing to learn, but you know, what's sort of interesting about it and a little bit paradoxical in terms of what I'm saying is that, you know, what I've noticed is that most people who understand things clearly can write them down clearly. That is at least a claim. I, I no, maybe the, the, the opposite is true. People who don't understand things clearly cannot write them down clearly. So maybe there are people, and actually now that I think about it, there are certainly people I know who understand things clearly, but have never learned to write particularly fluently. And so the stuff they write is very, very poorly constructed, even though they can explain things with, with, with good clarity. So I, I, perhaps I'm, I'm um, uh, so I, I don't know how, how teachable that is. I have never personally been a great fan of Bertrand Russell. Um, I have to say that I haven't um, uh, probably read, he wrote an awful lot of books and I have read few of them. Um, and I'm perhaps influenced by Principia Mathematica, which I consider to be not a very, uh, I mean, it was, a, it, was a, it was a project that was impressive for show, but in detail, just a mess, in my opinion. Um, the, uh, so I, I can't um, I can't comment on on those things. And I have to say, in terms of of philosophical works, I've uh, I don't know of sort of primary philosophy that Russell did that has been significant, at least in the kinds of things I've been interested in. Although I think potentially his exposition of sort of ambient philosophy was was good and clear. I mean, it's it's worth realizing that um, Alfred North Whitehead. Um, co-author, the first author actually, Principia Mathematica, was already a pretty distinguished mathematician. In fact, Whitehead's previous works, uh, his previous work, I think from 1900, was a book called Universal Algebra, um, which was a book about uh, kind of the, how you can take the, the framework of algebraic systems and generalize that framework. And, it's, it's, um, and that book is quite good. Um, and quite clear, and in many ways, much less crazy, well, much less crazy than Principia Mathematica. I mean, Whitehead went on to write a lot of books about education and, and so on. I, I have to say, I've not read most of those books um, and eventually ended up in the US um, uh, um, after a long, long career in England. Um, I haven't read his later works, so I can't comment on them. But um, yeah, it could be that two clear writers came together to produce an unreadable book in Principia Mathematica, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, um, in any case, the, the um, you know, this question about mathematical notation, I know that, uh, that Russell had met Piano, Giuseppe Piano, at, in 1900 at the International Congress of Mathematicians, the same one where Hilbert um, uh, enunciated his 23 problems of, for mathematics. Um, I think, Piano uh, has not fantastic notation, but much better, much less over the top notation than, uh, than Whitehead and Russell. Um, I mean, I think Piano had, um, had some uh, notation for implication that has been not perfectly successful, but, but he, had, he had a number of other notations which have caught on. Um, I think that um, uh, this, this whole idea of what will be understandable, kind of the art of designing notation is an art that people have only rarely understood. So for example, Leibniz, 
in the 1600s was quite into the art of designing notation, even though his own efforts like d by dx for, for derivatives, you know, he knew right off the, from the get-go that people would try and cancel the d's. And, but he thought, well, it's a, it's a cool notation. It's got some cute features. Let's go with it for the time being as a sort of preliminary notation. I found the place actually where, it, where he first writes down the S, the elongated S that became the integral sign and so on. But um, uh, you know, people at different times have been interested in notation. George Boole in the 1830s, pretty interested in notation. Um, uh, Alan Turing actually wrote an unpublished piece on mathematical notation. Um, he was interested in it, uh, but he didn't, there were things he, he understood and didn't understand. And one of the things that I think, well, von Neumann certainly didn't understand was the idea of, of subroutines, the idea of subfunctions in a program. So this notion that we'll write a program and it's a monolithic thing, von Neumann imagined that would be the way things worked. And so he thought nobody will ever write a program more than a few hundred lines long because, well, nobody would understand that. I don't know whether that was his logic, but he certainly said that, that he didn't expect long programs that have been written. He didn't understand this idea of modular programs and this idea of subfunctions and so on. It's surprising in retrospect, he didn't understand that because clearly mathematical proofs rely on other theorems, other lemmas and so on, and have that kind of hierarchical structure. But um, when it comes to, to Turing, it's um, uh, Turing was in many ways a sort of quintessential hacker and um, he, uh, you know, he had a lot of cute hacks. I mean, in addition to the Turing machine, which one could argue was something of a hack, he, you know, he invented a bunch of, you know, mechanical things for computing the Riemann zeta function by using a thing with cogs and so on. One can find his blueprints from that. He, I don't think it was ever he ever actually built it. It'd be a good thing for somebody to make these days. I wonder whether anybody has. Um, but uh, the, um, uh, you know, I remember looking years ago at uh, Turing's coding sheets from the Manchester computer from 1952-ish um, timeframe, I think. And they're unbelievably hacky. I mean, he had, you know, among his uh, moments of, um, um, of whatever, I mean, he was writing in, well, not in hex, he had to write, I think in base 64, and he decided he'll take the letters of the alphabet and then he'll take semicolons and all these different characters. And you get this absolutely unreadable sequence of, of characters that was some, I think, base 64, maybe base 32 uh, representation, maybe I think it was base 32 representation of things. Um, and uh, there was no notion of kind of um, uh, elegance in, uh, in programming at the time, in the time of Turing. Now, I don't know, it'd be an interesting question who first really grokked the idea of sort of elegance in programming? I think the people who were working on the Algol specification in 1960 maybe had some inkling of that kind of thing. I'm not sure. Um, because certainly in the time of, um, um, uh, in, in, you know, so the, the, the notion that notation mattered and notation was an art to produce good notation I think that was something that was not really well understood, perhaps not even well understood today. I certainly know that the design and the functional design of programs is something that is not well understood. I mean, it's something, language design, for example, is something that I'm not sure, uh, you know, people really understand as a thing. To me, language design, computational language design is one of the purest forms of sort of deep thinking that there is around. It's a thing where what one is trying to do is take all these different ideas and crisp them, you know, turn, find the essence of those ideas and represent them in a way that isn't just like poetry, sort of a right once, this is the form of the words type of thing, but it's something where you have to build kind of a, a, a mechanism that can be used in, a, in, in an infinite collection of different ways that is sort of an elegant representation of the essence of ideas. And for me, it's it's kind of, the, the best representation of the essence of ideas. And it's something about which, I mean, perhaps because I've spent 40 something years doing it, um, I think there is a lot to know and it's quite an art, uh, sort of a combination of an art and some kind of intellectual activity a philosophy or science, I'm not sure, um, to figure out kind of what is the, uh, you know, how do you 
uh, actually come up with sort of this essential representation of ideas. Um, and you know, I, as you may know, I do lots of live streams of my sort of uh, frontline efforts to design our computational language, open language, um, and uh, but I consider that a, a difficult thing. And I think that in the time of Whitehead and Russell, most likely they just didn't think it was a thing. They just thought we just throw in this notation and you know it'll people will learn it just like they've learned other notations and it'll all just work. And they didn't really understand that they were building some kind of art form that needed to be done in a careful way. Um, uh, I think um, there's a comment here from Memes about Einstein that um, at least he didn't name it space time stuff and things. Yeah, I mean, it is always interesting when you read, you know, English language and you know, obviously Einstein wrote in, in German, uh, which I can't indigenously read, um, but uh, um, so I, I can't really comment on, on his stylistic uh, character. Well, he wrote later in English, um, but um, um, you know, it is always interesting when you read kind of, uh, I don't know, Newton's optics was written in English. Newton's Principia was written in Latin, but he transitioned by the time he wrote his optics, he transitioned to writing in English. And it is interesting the extent to which uh, there's been evolution both in the, um, in the English language and in the mathematical language. So for example, in those times, I think people were still writing XXX to represent X cubed. It wasn't common to have exponent notation yet, things like that. Um, but it's, you know, you see these things that, uh, it, it is always funny to see, see things where uh, there are ways of describing things which sort of seem natural at the time and later on seem unbelievably ponderous. Like, for example, a good example of this is time dilation. It wasn't called time dilation back in the day. It was called time dilatation. That was the original, you know, if you look at early books in English on relativity, it's time dilatation. But somewhere that got you know, thought to be very ponderous and it just turned into time dilation. And now when you see dilatation, it sounds like some weird, uh, you know, antique form. And that's something that one, one sees happen quite, quite repeatedly. I mean, I think one of the ones that is really a thing that um, uh, gets to one when one sees it is the references to particularly, well, ambient thinking, ambient technology. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly, I could be a little bit cynical and say that some of the, the things that perhaps age most are the dedications to books. Um, and, uh, you know, there were times when it was always dedicated to, you know, the Duke who is allowing me to publish this or who's sponsoring me. You know, it's dedicated for the greater glory of God. It's dedicated to the funding agents. They're not quite dedicated to, but it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, it's 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 acknowledging the funding agency of the government X. It's um, giving a thing that says, you know, um, uh, this is being done to make the world a better place and so on. I think those kind of motivational and um, uh, acknowledgements kind of probably age the most if you look at, um, uh, at scientific documents, uh, followed by, you know, technological kinds of things where, there just are, are terms that over the course of 100 years, we, we just have no idea what they are. I and mean, you have to go look up um, some things where, where people are talking about them. And one that just comes to mind is Turing talking about Brunsvigas, which were a brand of mechanical calculator of his time, um, which is just completely unknown to us today. But, um, you know, I think that's a... Um, uh, uh, it's interesting that the names of like mathematical theories and so on have changed much less than the names of these kind of technological kinds of things. All right, I should probably, well, maybe I can take one more. Uh, I better, I think I'd better go to my, my next um, meeting here. Um, although there are lots of interesting questions here, which I'd love to um, address. Um, but I think we have to leave that.
uh, for another time. So, well, uh, thanks for joining me here today. And um, I just want to, I will give a shout out if you're interested in historical things. I just spent a whole bunch of time writing a bunch of this, uh, the history of the making of the, my new kind of science book, which is kind of a, a little bit of a, of a um, well, it's sort of interesting, perhaps for understanding a little bit about uh, how ideas progress, but it's also really a, a bit of a stroll down a memory lane of the technology of actually producing documents and uh, a deep dive into the adventures of printing a book, at very high resolution, um, and uh, some of the things that can go wrong. And I leave it, if you uh, haven't read it yet, I'm not going to uh, uh, do a, a spoiler here. Let's just say there are adventures that um, uh, we encountered in the production of the book, which you can read about there. All right, thanks very much. And uh...